welcome you once again to another Bible study. We're going to get into the word of the most high. We got a, I got a lot of stuff I'm going to try to cover today. We told our y'all for allowing us to see another Shabbat day. And I'm excited about this study today because we're going to be talking about the great war of Armageddon. There's something very particular about the war of Armageddon that's mentioned in the book of Revelation. The book of the prophet Joel prophesies about the war, the controversy that's going to happen in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And we're going to be dealing with that and why and how these nations are going to be gathered together in one place to literally war against the Most High. And all this has to do with the Mark of the Beast. We've been dealing with the Mark of the Beast series, talking about the second beast, how the second beast is going to be able to perform miracles and signs of wonders. And by the means of the miracles, he will be able to deceive the whole entire world. Then we went back and talked about how the book of Deuteronomy chapter 13 talks about how a false prophet or a dreamer of dreams that when they show you a sign or a wonder, a sign or a wonder, and that sign and that wonder comes to pass. And we talked about how false prophets can prophesy and their prophecies come to pass. They can literally perform signs or wonders, the Hebrew word mo faith in the Hebrew, wonders or miracles, and their miracles come to pass. But it is the dabar, it is the words that they speak to try to lure you to serve other deities or to serve other gods or to go out or stray from the path of righteousness that's intended or commended by the Most High Yah for us to follow. And the Most High says that he does this to prove us, to test us, to see whether or not we will love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to see if we're going to cling unto him. Then last week, we dealt with Second Thessalonians about how Paul was talking about the mystery of iniquity and it already working, the son of perdition being revealed. And he was warning the assembly there in the book of, of Thessalonians how there will be two major events that will transpire before the day of Yah or the day of Yahuwah, the day of Yahweh actually occur. And that is the great falling away and the man of sin being revealed. And we looked up the word, the word uh, sin. And how that word sin, even in the Greek linguistics, it is referencing to violation of law, transgression of law. So those who walk in sin or the son of perdition or the man of sin himself will be someone that's not subject to Israelite law. And we looked up that word also in the same chapter where it says that the wicked shall be revealed. That word wicked there is capitalized. The W there is capitalized. And we looked that word up even in the Greek vernacular. And it means a person that is not subject to Israelite law. Okay. They are not subject to Israelite law. It, it says by implication, a Gentile. This would be a Gentile, a non-Israelite that will rise to power and he will come after the working of Satan performing signs and lying wonders in order to deceive the masses of people. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. Okay. So we're going to go into uh, some deeper understanding why these miracles are going to be performed. Why is the anti-Messiah, quote unquote, antichrist is going to work these miracles and these signs and wonders in order to gather the masses of people. He is gathering the masses of people for a reason. There is a purpose behind why the anti-Messiah is going to gather the nations together. Now, I want y'all to understand this. This war, this battle of Armageddon, it's, it's a spiritual war, but it's literally a war. It's, it's going to be a physical altercation against the King of Kings, Yahshua the Messiah, as he comes back to establish the nation of Israel upon the face of the earth and to establish the thousand year or the millennial reign of Messiah upon the face of the earth, where he will rule with a rod of iron to make all enemies subject to the righteous authority and rulership of the Melku, the kingdom of the Most High. It's going to be a literal physical altercation. The beast, the dragon, the false prophet is going to gather and assemble a great 
army, a great multitude, to fight against Messiah. Messiah is literally coming to war against Hasatan, against the establishment of Satan's last stance against the Melku or the kingdom of the Most High. And we're going to deal with that. Hallelujah. We're going to begin. Let's see here. Let's, let's start here. I want to review a couple of scriptures here before we get into the meat and potatoes of everything that we want to talk about today. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, because uh, we all should be pretty much familiar with these passages of scripture. So I'm just going to run through these right quick. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. I'm going to start here. And it says, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb and spake as a dragon. This is a representation of the anti hamashiach the false prophet. And it says that he had two horns like a lamb, but he spake as Hasatan, as the dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast who deadly wound was healed. So the objective of the second beast is to cause everybody upon the earth to worship the first beast. And the first beast is uh, here mentioned in Revelation chapter 12. The first beast is the sequel, Daniel chapter 9, the fourth beast, okay? And uh, we haven't gotten into that yet, but maybe later on we'll deal with that at a later time, all right? And it says in verse 13, of Revelation chapter 13, and he doeth great wonders so that he make a fire come down uh, out of heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So he's going to do this in the very sight of men. We have technology such as internet, TV, and these, he's going to be literally be able to perform these signs whereby he will call down fire out of heaven in the sight of men. Verse 14, and he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image of the beast who had the wounded by the sword and did live. So by the means of the miracles that the second beast will be able to perform, the false prophet, the anti-Messiah, he will deceive the world by the means of these miracles, okay? All right. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. I'm going to read through this right quick. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1. It says, And if there arise a prophet or a nabi or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign, the Hebrew word is oath, and are a wonder. The Hebrew word for wonder is mo faith. And we elaborated upon that in, I think it was part five of this teaching series. He says in verse two, and the sign and the wonder comes to pass. So we're not talking about a sign or a wonder that is performed and it doesn't come to pass. The sign and wonder comes to pass, comes to fruition. Whereof he spake, Dabar, he spake unto thee, saying, let us go at the other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. So this false prophet, this worker of miracles will be able to, to perform the miracle, and the miracle will come to pass. But what he will say, the dabar, the doctrine, the teaching of what he will teach will draw people away from serving the Most High and to serve other deities or other gods. He says in verse 3, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words, to the dabar of that prophet or dreamer of dreams, for Yah, your Elohim, proveth you to know whether you love Yahweh, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul. He says in verse 4, you shall halak, you shall walk after Yah, your Elohim, and Yahweh, fear him, morally reverence him, and shamar, hedge a protection around his commandments to shama, to shama, to listen to obey, to hear to obey the voice of Yah. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And he says in the verse 5, And the dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to turn you away from Yahweh, your Elohim, which brought you out of the land of Mizraim and redeemed you from the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the derrick, out of the way, the course of action, the mode of life, the action or the course of life, which Yah, thy Elohim, commanded thee to halat, to walk in, and thou shalt 
put the evil from away from the midst of thee. So we see here that false prophets can work miracles, but what they say is important. That is what we should be looking for. What is the, the bar? Because that second beast that came up out of the earth, he had horns like a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. So the, the bar, the utterance, the doctrine that that anti-Messiah will teach and say will be words of perdition. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24. He says, for there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets, which shall sow great signs and wonders. This is Yahshua saying this. He said that there shall arise false messiahs, anti-messiahs, and false prophets, and they shall sow great wonders in, in so much that if it was possible that they would deceive the very elect. So we have to be very careful in this time, my brothers and sisters. We cannot base our faith upon working of miracles. Now, I believe that y'all work miracles. We talked about that how the spirit of the most high will use us to perform miracles, signs and wonders. But these miracles are based upon the observance of keeping Yah's commandments. OK. Second uh, Thessalonians, second Thessalonians. I just want to read a few verses here. OK. He says here in, let's see. Verse three, second Thessalonians, chapter two, verse three. And if you want to, I got the verses up on the screen. You can just follow right along with me. And we're going to run through these because we already elaborated on these. But I just want to do a quick summary so we can lead into the uh, core of what we want to talk about this Shabbat. He says, let no man deceive you. This is Apostle Paul saying this. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first and the man of sin be manifest or reveal the son of perdition. So the anti-Messiah, John talks about the anti-Messiah spirit that's already working in the earth realm, but the anti-Messiah is a literal man. It is a being, a man, a human being who will be the embodiment of the nature of Satan. He will be the son of perdition and he will go after the working of Hasatan. OK. He goes on to say once again in the same chapter, verse six, he says, and now, ye you know, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So this man of sin shall be revealed in his time. We know that the Most High deals with time and season. He doesn't do things just out of the whim, especially when it comes to prophecy. Okay? The scripture says, in the fullness of time, Yah sent his son, Yahshua, born of a woman, made under the law. So in that fullness of time, Yah sent his son. So the Most High has a specific time and season as it relates to prophetic events unfolding. He goes on to say in verse seven of the same chapter, second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let will let to be taken out of the way. So the mystery of iniquity does already work. The anti-Messiah will be the epitome of iniquity. Avon in the Hebrew lawlessness. He will be a transgressor of the law. He will not submit himself to the law of the Most High, or to the Israelite law. Hallelujah. And that iniquity spirit is already working in the earth realm today. Christianity purports that we don't no longer have to follow the commandments and the laws of the Most High, especially the Shabbat, the Sabbath day. We don't have to keep the feast days of the Most High. All those things have been done with Christ, the pagan image, the Cleisto, their Christ, has done away with the law of the Most High. And we know that is a false representation of the true Messiah, the true Hamashiach, who told us to keep the law. If we want to have eternal life, keep the commandments. That's what the true Messiah told us. But the false Messiah is going to tell you everything opposite of what the true Messiah says. And that is the anti-Messiah spirit that Christianity has purported. It has spread its poison throughout all the earth. All nations have drunken of the wine of her fornication. Therefore, they shall receive of her plagues. All right. That's what Revelations chapter 
18 teaches us. First John chapter four, verse three. He said, every spirit that confesseth not Yahshua the Messiah has come in the flesh. Messiah came in the flesh. He was not a carcass, a Caucasian man. He was a Israelite, a Hebrew Israelite from the tribe of Yahuda. He was a melanated man. He was a man of color. But what is the image that has been purported and brainwashed in the minds of society today? This white, effeminate looking, long haired white man from Europe. That is the image that they have purported. When the Messiah was in the earth, his flesh didn't look like that. He was a melanated man. But Satan will always try to deceive the masses of people. Why? Because we are under the Gentile rule and the Gentile reign. That fourth beast is ruling today. The fourth beast is ruling today. He says that every spirit or every person that does not acknowledge that Messiah has come in the flesh is not of Elohim. And this is the spirit of anti-Messiah. This is the spirit. This is the very nature of the anti-Messiah. Whereof ye have heard that should come and even now already is in the world. Already it is in the world. The mystery of iniquity is already working. That anti-Messiah spirit is working in the lives and in the minds of individuals. That's why they hate the commandments of the Most High. That's why they hate the true lineage or the true elect people of the Most High Yah. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. He said, wherein, this is Paul saying this, wherein in times past you walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, the children of Avon, iniquity. They are workers of iniquity. The anti-Messiah is a worker of iniquity. He is the very embodiment of halal, Satan. The scripture says that Halal, the cherubim, when he revolted against the Most High, iniquity was found in him. Lawlessness was found in him. He rebelled against the very authority and rulership of Yah Almighty, and he was thrust out of the kingdom or out of Hashemiah. And that is the very nature, the very spirit that is working in the children of disobedience. Let's jump back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 8, we're going to elaborate upon this just a little bit. Just want to revisit, refresh, stir up our pure minds by way of remembrance. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. Look at what he says. And then shall that wicked be revealed, the son of perdition, the man of sin. He said, and then shall that wicked be revealed. This word here in the Greek, even the Greek linguistics give us a good understanding of what this word is referring to and who it is referring to. The Greek word is anmos, anmos. It is lawless, that is negatively, not subject to Jewish, so we know that that word should be Israelite. He's not subject to the Israelite law, to Israel's law, to the law that Yah gave Moshe to give to the children of Israel. He's not subject to the law of Yah. Implication, a Gentile. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentile until the times of the Gentile is fulfilled. We are living in the rulership of the Gentile kingdom. Satan is using, he is the phantom. Satan is the phantom behind this Gentile rule or this Gentile kingdom. They are pushing Satan's agenda and objective and all of these things that Satan is doing, he is gathering the nations together for one purpose. The miracles that the anti-Messiah will be able to perform in the sight of men he is trying to deceive them and to bring 
all nations. He is trying to build a master's multitude of people to do one thing, the very same thing that Satan did in the beginning, Hallel did in the beginning. One thing that he did, he revolted against the rulership of Yah. He is gathering the nations together for one specific thing, and we're going to see that as we go on. So we see that word wicked here means lawless one. He is not subject to Israelite law. Look at verse 9 of the same chapter, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. He says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, this wicked one, the anti-Messiah, his coming will be after the very nature, the epitome nature of Hasatan. He is coming after the working of Satan with all power and sign and lying wonders. He's coming with power, my brothers and sisters. But what did Yahshua say to his disciples? Yahshua said to his followers, he said, I have given you power to tread on serpents, on scorpions, and all the power of the enemy. So as long as we remain in obedience and we save God, we shamar the, and keep the commandments of Yah, we have power over the power of Hasatan. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. This iniquity spirit, this mystery of iniquity that's already working in the children of disobedience, what's working in us is greater than that. And that's why Satan is going to make war with the remnant of the seed of the woman. Revelation chapter 12 talks about that. Those who have the testimony, the witness of Yahshua, they have the edaf in the Hebrew, the witness and the testimony of Yahshua, and they keep the commandments of Yah. Because the very establishment of Satan's kingdom, the very objective and agenda of iniquity is against the law and statutes, commandments of the Most High. He says this in verse 10. Look what he says. And with all deceivingness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. In order for us to be saved, to receive the salvation of Yahshua, Hamashiach, the redemption that is going to happen in these lasting evil days for the children and for all believers that have placed their faith in Yahshua the Messiah and that's fallen after the commandments of Yah. We have to love the truth. That we said that thy righteousness is a everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. A lot of my messages over the years, the years since I've been preaching, ever since the age of 18, I have always preached and have always taught vehemently with passion concerning the obedience and the importance of the law and the commandments of the Most High. Why? Because that is the establishment of Yah's kingdom shall be established upon his righteous acts and deeds. Look at verse 11 of the same chapter. And for this cause, Elohim shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all might be damned. Yah says, I'm going to send every last one of them to the lake of fire. I'm going to damn them. I'm going to condemn them. Yes, the most high that we serve is a most high of love, but he is a most high of war. He's a most high of hate. He's a most high of damnation. You cannot have perfect love without perfect hate. You can't say that you love the most high and you don't hate the pernicious, deceitful, and sinful ways of the world. You can't say that you love the Most High and you don't have hate for the very sin and the iniquity that we as the people of Yah have committed against Yah and our forefathers have committed against Yah. We have to have hatred for the things that Yah hate. And we got to have love for the things that Yah loves. So you can't have perfect hate without perfect love, my brothers and sisters. And you can't have perfect love without hate. I hate sin. I hate wickedness. I hate sin and wickedness in the world, and I hate sin and wickedness in my own heart. That's why I search the root of my love, the root of my heart, the century of my mind to eradicate anything 
or any thought that exalt itself against the knowledge of Yah. Why? Because I hate that wickedness. I hate that sin. And I want the love of Yah to permeate in my heart, whereby I will keep his commandments, strive vehemently to keep his commandments. Hallelujah. Let's go on. We're going to continue to go on. Let's review Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. This is very important. Very important. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You can see it on the screen there. You can read it on the screen right here. I'm going to run through it right quick. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith, Master, Master, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth. He that doeth the will of my Abba, my Father which is in heaven. So only those that do it what Yah's purpose and will is are those who are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Even Messiah said at the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done, O Yah. We have to do the will and the purpose of Yah, any time that we do our own will or our own purpose and it is not congruent with the will and the purpose of Yah, we are operating in the very nature of iniquity and we are working after the very nature of the anti-Messiah of Hallel. Why? Because Hallel sought to do his own will aside from doing what he was created by the Most High to do. And that's why when you hear preachers, when they talk about themselves, I this and I do this and I that and I, 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 I. You better know there's a spirit of iniquity working in them. I've heard pastors and preachers, the only thing they talk about is themselves. I this and I don't do that and I used to do this and I. No, it's not about I. It's about Yah. It's about his way, his truth. We are to acknowledge him in all our ways. And he would direct our path in doing that. Not acknowledging ourselves before Yah. We don't put no other gods before Yah. That is the epitome of iniquity that's working in the earth realm today. Because everything is about I, I, me, me. He goes on to say, many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils in thy name? And done many wonderful works. Many wonderful works. We have prophesied. We cast out devils. We healed the sick in thy name. Look at what Yahshua is going to say. And then I will profess unto them. I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. You have worked iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. The very epitome in nature of Halal. Satan, the anti-Messiah. It's based upon iniquity. He said, you are a worker of iniquity. That word is ammonia. Ammonia. If you can see it right there on the screen. Violation of law or wickedness. Iniquity. Transgression. Transgression of the law. Unrighteousness. So when a person operates in iniquity, it affords them the ability to cast out devils, to heal the sick. It affords them the ability to prophesy and their prophecy come to pass. But what is the doctrine that they're speaking? What is the teaching that they're teaching? What are they saying to you? The, the bar. Are they trying to cast you out of the way? Are they trying to lure you to error from the way that the Most High has commanded you to walk in? And when a person speaks with that nature, they're speaking out of the very epitome of iniquity. They are practitioners of lawless miracles, lawless prophecies. And their prophecies and their miracles and their work is after the working of Hasatan. The same nature that the anti-Messiah is going to work in. That's why he's going to be able to. To see the masses of people. Why? Because that mystery of iniquity is already working in the earth realm today. Many individuals that you know today is operating in that iniquity spirit. Why? Because they don't have love for the truth. They hate the word of Yah. You tell them that they got to keep the Shabbat day. 
that they got to keep the commandments of Yah. Well, I, I'm, I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. They have turned the grace of Yah into lasciviousness. I heard that snake, that big fat snake Jake's bishop, snake the Jake's. He got himself caught up in some scandals with P. Diddy. They caught him in some of those uh, sexual uh, 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 exploits and stuff like that with P. Diddy. And he was given a message in response to the allegations that have been uh, uh, pronounced on him. And he said, even if I did do it, the grace of God is there. I could be forgiven because of God's grace. They've turned the grace of Yah into lasciviousness. They think that they could do every wicked, abominable, pernicious thing there is and think that they can just call on the grace of Yah and all is forgiven. No, my brothers and sisters. Shall we continue in sin that the grace of Yah shall abound? Yah forbid. Yah says hell to the now. Hell to the now. Don't think that you can abuse the grace of Yah and continue in iniquity and lawlessness and think that you're going to escape the wrath and condemnation and judgment of the Most High. But Christianity has purported that lie and billions of people are following the very nature of the beast. They are worshiping the beast. And they don't even know it. Why? Because Yah has sent them a strong delusion that they will walk in a lie, that they will believe a lie, that they would give their very lies for a lie that they might. This is the purpose. That they might be damned. Yah said, I'm going to send you all to hell. That's what Yah says. I know we used to these Israelite teachers and preachers sugarcoating everything. But we need preachers today of the old way. See, I came from the old way, the old teachers, the old elders. I had old elders teaching me. Y'all put me around older men that instructed me. And that's how they were taught. They didn't sugarcoat the word. They told the truth and nothing but the truth. Hallelujah. All right. We're going to continue on, my brothers and sisters. Now, if you have your scriptures, if you have your scriptures, paperback or electronic, let's turn to this. I want everybody to put their eyes on this here. Let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. If someone throw a one in the chat for me when you get there so I know that everybody's there. I'm not out reading everybody because I definitely want everybody to put their eyes on this here. All praise to the Most High. Shalom, Ab Ben Amin. Shabbat shalom to you, my brother. Hallelujah. All right. Look what he says here. He said, now the Spirit speaketh expressively. The Spirit is speaking expressively to us who are of the true remnant of the house of Israel. That in the latter days some shall depart from the imunah, faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines that are taught. They speak out of the very utterance of the devil, of the dragon, of Satan himself. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They don't even have a consciousness to speak lies and blasphemy against the Most High. And they will hide under the cloak. They will even use the scriptures. They will even try to turn the truth of Yah into lies in order to serve their abominable and pernicious ways. He says that their conscience will be seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry, and commanded to abstain from meats which Yah has created. 
to be received with thanksgiving to them which believe and know the truth. That's a mouthful in itself. That's a whole nother teaching. A lot of people say, well, show me the dietary laws in the New Testament. There it go right there. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, the apostle Paul is giving us, and he is confirming the dietary laws in that particular chapter there, but we're not going to go there today. But what he says here, to be received with thanksgiving to them that believe and know the truth, you can only receive something with thanksgiving unless it is, unless it is established and made permissible by the truth. And even in this hour, you have individuals telling you, oh, you can't eat this meat, you can't eat that meat, you can't eat this, you can't eat that. Paul said that there, in the last days that there were those who would tell you that you got to stay away from certain foods, certain meats, certain foods that Yah has created to be received with thanksgiving. See, Yah didn't create every animal to be received with thanksgiving. He didn't create the pig to be received with thanksgiving. That's not food. He didn't create the catfish to be received with thanksgiving. He told us what things that we are to eat and not to eat as it relates to food and meat. You can't take a pig and give thanks for it. Why? Because y'all didn't create it to be received with thanksgiving as food or as meat. And those of us who know the truth, we know the truth. We know what y'all's words say. You can't call something clean or you can't call something unclean that's clean. Y'all's word says it's unclean and it's unclean. You can't make it clean because you pray over it. Then you're praying against the word of Yah. You're praying against Yah's will. Because Yah's word said it's unclean. All right? That's another teaching for another time. But Paul is giving us the dietary laws right here. He is confirming that and approving that. I actually got a message on this on my YouTube page. It's an older message. I probably preached it about seven, six years ago concerning that. All right. Let's go to the second Timothy chapter 3 verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 13. We got two verses here. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 13 and 14. I'm going to go ahead and read it. He said, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. In the things which thou hast learned, and look, look what he says. He says that deceivers and seducers, they're going to grax worse and worse and worse and worse. But he said, you continue in the things that you have learned and has been assured of knowing. He said the things that you have learned and the things that have been confirmed and the things that have been assured in your life, he said, continue in those things. Knowing, he said, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Who's, who are you learning from? I know we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit teaches of all things. But who is the more the teacher that you have learned what you learned from? See, we got to take all that stuff into consideration, my brothers and sisters. You cannot get sweet water out of a bitter cistern. And you cannot get bitter water out of a sweet cistern, my brothers and sisters. If a man's life is not congruent with what he teaches or preaches, you better know the individual of whom you have learned what you learned from. A lot of us have learned a lot of doctrine, false teaching from false teachers and false uh, apostles, false prophets. That's why I tell everybody, I want you to know my lifestyle. I want you to Critique me. Judge me. 
I want you to know the matter of man that I am. Because I don't want you just to say, oh, what Brother Pat says is, is he's passionate about the word. It sounds good. and it's, it, He preaches with authority. He teaches with authority. That, that can lead you astray. But how is I'm living my life? What does my wife and my kids and those that are around me say about me? What evil reports does anybody have to say about me? And I say, ain't nobody got no evil reports about our path well. Because I watch what I say and I watch what I do. I've been to certain gatherings where I see the mores, they're drinking, they're drunkards. They bring out the wine and the hard liquor and the elders and the leaders of the assembly are sitting there drinking and getting drunk. What type of example are you setting before those who are you supposed to be shepherding? What type of example are you setting before the young men? We're to be sober and to be vigilant, watchful, cold sober. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. In order to do that, you got to watch every circumstance and situation that you're in. And you have to reframe yourself, remove yourself from the very appearance of what is evil. I've seen so many preachers and pastors getting trapped in iniquitous practices. Why? Because they're not watching. They're not being sober. They're not being vigilant. And we have to be sober and be vigilant, my brothers and sisters, especially in these last and evil days. You got to know the individual in whom you learn what you learned from. And their lives must be congruent with the words that they speak. Hallelujah. Let's go on to um, Revelations. Revelations chapter 16, verse 12. We talked about evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse. And the very epitome of the spirit of iniquity working in the lives of individuals because they won't receive the love of the truth. This is the very establishment of the anti-Messiah. The very miracles that he is performing. He's performing for a reason. There is an objective behind it, my brothers and sisters. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Will someone get there? Put a one in the chat for me, my brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. All right, we got a one in the chat. Revelations chapter 16, verse 12. And this is the foundation. This is the core of this teaching today. We're going to see why these miracles are being performed. The anti Messiah is performing these miracles. He is feeding upon the iniquity that's already working in the individuals. Our trade told us a couple of weeks ago, a couple of Shabbats ago, that the anti Messiah is only going to fulfill the desire that's already in the hearts of the people. Everybody in this world today is being prepped by iniquity, by rebellion, by revolting against the law and statutes of com the commandments of the of Most High. They are being prepped to receive the anti-Messiah because he's going to cater to the iniquity that's already working in them. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. This is the apostle Yachanan. On the Isle of Patmos, as Yah gave him the revelation of the end times. He says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 12, And the sixth Malach, or angel, poured out his vow upon the great river Euphrates. What do we see what happened with the river Euphrates right now? It's drying up. I meant to get some pictures of that so I can show that on the screen. It's drying up. Many parts of the river Euphrates is already dried up. This is a sign of the prophetic times that we are in. Why is the river Euphrates drying up, my brothers and sisters? The prophecy goes on to tell us, if we read it in context, it says that the sixth angel poured out his vow upon the great river Euphrates, and the waters thereof were dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. What are they preparing for? What are the kings of the east Preparing for. If we read this in its contextual perspective, it will answer every question. Each verse is going to answer itself. That's what context is. You, 
can't get the context of a verse just reading that one verse. You have to read what's above it and underneath it. A lot of times people take verses out of context because they only read that one verse and then they try to equate it to something that is not within the boundary lines or the, the, the frame, the framing of the context of what the particular statement or word is being used. Then it loses its contextual value when you do that. It's very important to understand those things, my brothers and sisters. He says that this river Euphrates is going to be dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. What are they preparing for? He says, and I saw three unclean spirits. The, speak, the spirit speaketh expressively in the latter days. Many set apart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Yachadon said, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon. And out of the mouth, the pet in the Hebrew, the mouth, the utterance, the debar of the beast. And out of the mouth of the false prophet. He said the very utterance of what ushered out of their mouth was unclean spirits being spoken. See, a false prophet can lay hands on the sick and they recover. He can prophesy. God is going to bless you with a house and in the car. When you get back to the house, you open up the mailbox, you're going to have a check in the mail for $200,000. And in many cases, in some cases, a lot of times these things happen. But the very utterance was proceeding out of that prophet's mouth. It's unclean spirits like frogs. Why? Because they will not speak and expound upon the foundation of the righteousness of Yah, which is his law, statutes, and commandments. They won't tell that individual that they pray for. They, they got to stop fornicating and sleeping around. They won't reprove them of their sin. They won't tell them you got to keep the commandments of the Most High and repent and turn from your wicked ways. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, for they are the spirits. They are the ruachs, the spirits of devils. He said that they are the spirits of devils. Devils, look at what these devils are doing. Working miracles. Which go forth unto the kings of the earth. And to all the world to gather them to the battle. These are unclean spirits. Working miracles. To gather the kings together unto the battle. Satan is trying to amass an army for the battle. I'm just not talking about spiritual battle, my brothers and sisters. This battle is going to be a physical altercation. As Yahshua cracked them skies in flame and fire, coming with the host of Melikim to war. Satan is going to have his amassed army to battle against Yahshua. He's prepared them. He's gathering the kings of the earth. The river Euphrates is drying up. Why? Because he's preparing for war. What a prophet said that's, pre that's teaching like this, that's saying this stuff. Where are the Hebrew mores? Where are the elders, the ancient men, who have lifted up their voice like a shofar and warned God's people? This is what we're going to be up against, my brothers and sisters. Yah is preparing his people for war. Satan is preparing his people 
for war, for the battle. When Yahshua coming, he's coming with the heavy, with destruction to destroy the amassed armies of Hasatan. How is Satan going to do it? These are the spirit of devils working miracles to gather the kings of the earth for battle. They're going to try to fight against Yahshua. This is literal. This is not some figmentation or some fairy tale. Is it spiritual? Yes, it is. Everything that Yah speaks is spiritual. There's nothing, I want y'all to understand this, my brothers and sisters. There's nothing that happens in the earth realm unless it is happening in the spiritual realm. Nothing in this earth. Even if I say to myself, oh, I want to go get a drink of water. That thought is generated in the spirit of my mind. It's a spiritual thing first. And then I physically act upon what I have spiritually internalized in my mind or in my thoughts. Listen, that's why Paul said, be renewed where? In the spirit of your mind. The spiritual realm is real. The spiritual realm manifests itself through the physicality, through the physical things that we see, feel, and touch. If you are a spiritual-minded person, if you have the spirit of Yah working in you, there are certain fruits that's going to manifest physically from you. But we have made the spiritual realm this elusive thing. But not understanding that everything that we do as a people, we are being influenced by a spirit to do it. In order to walk in the righteousness of Yah, in order to keep his commandments, you got to be influenced by the spirit of Yah. In order for you to disobey the commandments of Yah, you got to be influenced by a spirit that's telling you to do opposite of what the spirit of Yah is telling you to do. Look what he goes on to say, my brothers and sisters. Verse 14 again. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of Yahweh, or Yahweh Almighty. Look what he says in verse 15. This is Messiah speaking here. This one verse here. He says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments. Because he walketh naked and they see not their shame. Don't you know there's people out here walking naked spiritually? And they don't see their wickedness. They don't see their shame. Yah has sent them a strong delusion that they may believe a lie that they all might be down. They're just like that. For that folklore about the, 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 the king, the emperor with his new clothes. He was convinced that he had the best garments on, but he was walking around naked the whole entire time. His shame being revealed. And that's why we have to watch and we have to keep our garments clean, unspotted from the world, my brothers and sisters. The what he says in Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. And he gathered them together into the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon. Armageddon. Let's do this very quickly. We're going to reference this particular passage of scripture that we just read. Revelation chapter 16. We begin at Revelation chapter 16, verse 12. Through verse 16. We're going to reference this to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. This is where this prophecy is found in the Old Testament, in the law and the prophets. 
The battle of Armageddon is found. Yah declares the end from the beginning. Yachanan didn't see nothing no different than all the other prophets did in the times of antiquity. We have to be able to rightly divide the words of truth. Hear a little and dare a little. Look what he says here. I'm going to look this word up before we go on. Let me put this up on the screen here. Before we go to Zechariah, y'all can go ahead and turn there, though. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. I want to define this word Armageddon here. I'm going to pull this up so we all can see it here right quick. Let's look at this word Armageddon here. The word Armageddon. Of Hebrew origin, Hab Megadon, a symbolic name for Armageddon. So remember that the word Armageddon, the word Armageddon is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Har Megadon. Ha Megadon. Okay? Remember that word Megadon there in the book of Zechariah where we're getting ready to read that. I want y'all to see that. Make sure you understand that. That word Megadon there. We're going to Read about the word Megadon, and there's another Hebrew word that we're going to read about too. And these particular uh, Megadon or Armageddon is found in the valley of Jehoshaphat. All right, we're not going to have enough time to actually get into the geographical location of that today. But that's where it's found. It's, one, it's, in, it's a plains that is found in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Mentioned in the book of Joel. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. Someone put a one in the chat if you're there in uh, Zechariah chapter 12. I'll make sure. Okay. All right. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. The burden of the word of Yahweh for Israel, saying, Yahweh, which stretcheth forth the heavens, left the foundations of the old lamb, of the elith, the earth, and formeth the ruach, the spirit of man, with in him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about. He says, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to the people round about. When they shall be in siege, both against Yehuda and against Jerusalem. He says, and in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves. With it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Y'all see that? What's the false prophet going to do? These are the spirits of devils working miracles. They go forth to all the kings of the earth to gather them to battle to the great day of Yah, Yahweh. He says that all the people will be gathered against it. And in that day, saith Yah, I will smite every horseman with astonishment and his rider with madness. I will open the eyes upon the house of Yahuda and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Yehuda shall say in their hearts, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in Yahweh of hosts, their Elohim. He said that even the governors, the rulers of Yehuda will strengthen themselves in the very power and the might of Yahweh Almighty. He says, in that day I will make the governors of Yehuda like the hearth of fire among the wood and like the torch of fire in the sheath. And they shall devour all the people round about them on the right side and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even Jerusalem. Yah. Also shall save the tents of Yehuda. First, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
do not magnify themselves against Yehuda. He says, in that day shall Yahweh defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he that is feeble among them that day shall be as David. <laughs> All praises to the Most High. He said that even those that are feeble, they're going to be like David. David was a fierce warrior. David was a man of war. He said, even the feeble men of Yehuda, I would give them the spirit of Dawid. And they will fight and they will war. They will strengthen themselves in the strength and in the might of Yah Almighty. And the house of David shall be as Elohim, as the angel of Yahweh before them. He says, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek the destruction of all the nations that come against Jerusalem. He says, and I will pour upon the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced him as one for his own son, and they shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Yah says that I'm going to give grace and supplication to the house of Yehuda. When they look upon Yahshua the Messiah and they see that this is the one that our forefathers crucified. And when they see the piercing of the marks in his hand, and in his feet. Look what he goes on to say in verse 11. And in that day shall there be a great morning in Jerusalem. As the morning of Hadaramah. Hadaramah. And the valley of Megadon. Y'all see that word Megadon there? Megadon. That is the Hebrew word or transliteration for the word Armageddon, Armageddon, Megalodon. He says, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, and their wives apart, for the family of Shammah apart, and their wives apart, all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart. So Yah says that I'm going to defend Jerusalem in the day of the great controversy, in the day of Armageddon. When Yah's wrath is poured upon the nations, when they come against Jerusalem to fight against Yahweh of hosts. Yah says that the tribe of Yahudah shall look upon Yahshua the Messiah and they're going to realize that Yahshua the Messiah was our Messiah all alone. And they're going to recognize and they're going to weep with a great weeping and supplication before the Most High and grace shall be found for the house of Yahuda. Hallelujah. Look what he says in the book of Joel. Let's go to the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 1. Hallelujah. Put a one in the chat when you get there so I can go ahead and start reading. I'm going to go ahead and read this right quick. And then we're going to open up for uh, commentary. Joel, chapter 3, verse 1. And it reads, he says, For behold, the days in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Yehuda in Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nation, parted the land, and they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine. That's our people, my brothers and sisters. That literally happened to us as a people. He said, yea, 
And what have ye to do with me, Tyre and Zidon and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye render me a recompense? And if you, and if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, I will return your recompense upon your own head. Because you have taken my silver and gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. The children also, Yehuda, and the children of Jerusalem, have ye sold to the Grecians that they might be removed far from their borders. Behold, I will, ra I will raise them out of the places where the ye have sold them and returned them. Return your recompense upon your own head. I will sell your sons and daughters into the hands of the children of Yehuda, and they shall sell them to the Sabines, to a people far off. For Yah has spoken. Proclaim ye among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares. He said, beat your agricultural tools into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourself. Come all, ye heathen. Gather yourself together round about hither. Cause the mighty men to come down. Oh, Yah, let the heathen be weakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Hallelujah. He says that he's going to judge the heathen at the valley of Jehoshaphat. Armageddon or Megalodon. It's the Hebrew translation for the word Armageddon, okay? Megalodon or Armageddon is a plain in the valley of Jehoshaphat. It's the same place. It's the same place as the valley of Jehoshaphat. And when you do a geographical study on that, you will see that, okay? So this is where this great war is going to take place. In the valley of Jehoshaphat, Armageddon, Megalodon, the war of Megalodon, where Yah will plead for his people and he will avenge us of our adversaries. Look what he goes on to say. He says, look at this. He says, put in your sickle for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down. For the press is full, the fats overflow, for the wickedness is great. He said multitudes, multitudes. He said multitudes, multitudes. We're talking about probably millions, billions of people. In the valley of decision, Armageddon, Megalodon, the valley of Jehoshaphat, for the day of Yah is near. In the valley of decision. In the valley of decision. He said multitudes, multitudes of people are going to be gathered there. Yah's going to gather all the nations there. The anti Messiah will gather all the kings of the east. And that's why the river of Euphrates is going to be dried up to battle, to war against Yah. In the valley of Jehoshaphat, Megalodon, Armageddon, and this is why these unclean spirits are going forth in the earth. They are gathering the multitude of nations together. They're gathering the multitude of people to fight alongside the anti-Messiah against Yahshua HaMashiach and against the chosen people of the house of Israel as Yah establishes Jerusalem once again. He says, the sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining, and Yahweh also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but Yahweh 
will be the tikva, the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. I pray that this teaching was a great inspiration to your hearts today. And I pray that we have been inspired to press on in the faith and to understand the things that's going to befall this world and our redemption as the children of Israel. Let us continue to press on in the Amuna and in the faith of Yah, because there is a great reward that is waiting for us if we endure to the end. May the Most High bless you. May the Most High keep you once again. I am Rahapathwell bin Yaakov.